Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back for the second part of uh, this lecture. And we're going to talk about the energy associated with phase changes. And first of all, uh, just a quick review from your thermochemistry unit back in Chem 1. So we talk about uh, two different types of uh, processes. We talk about the endothermic and the exothermic process. And so if we were to take ice and we were to melt it, we would apply what we call the heat of fusion. Heat of fusion has a specific value. And so that's the amount of energy needed to melt a mole of ice. And so then if we were to go in the reverse direction where we were to take a liquid and we were to freeze it, we would have the heat of freezing, which would then take on the opposite sign. So when we have an endothermic process, we have a positive value for the change in energy. And when we have a exothermic process, we're going to have a uh, negative value. So if one is the reverse of the other, then one becomes positive, the other becomes negative. And so and the same would be true for the uh, vaporization of water. And so there's a positive value because energy is needed to be pulled into the liquid in order for it to vaporize or in order for it to condense to go in the opposite direction then energy must be taken away from that system. And so again, we see the difference here between the positive value and the negative value for um, the vaporization versus the condensation. So how do we um, attribute the large difference in energy from the heat of fusion to the heat of vaporization? Well, in one case it's six, in the other case it's 40. Well, it's all got to do with um, the whole idea of intermolecular attractions. So in order to go from a solid to a liquid, the, um, you, you're going to have to break all forces in order for that to happen. And then um, to go from just a liquid to a gas, some of your forces, your interparticle attractions are already broken. And so that's what would um, account for that large difference between the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization. So a couple others are just the sublimation and the deposition. Again, sublimation going from solid to gas is a positive value going from the gas back to the solid it's a negative value. So let's take a look at the heating curve for a solid turning into a gas. So this is your classic heating curve. Here, as the temperature is changing, it's in the solid phase right at the melting point. It's in what we call the solid liquid phase. And what we see here is that the temperature is not changing. All right, and as so down here on my x axis, that would just be the passing of time in seconds or minutes, whatever your experiment um, called for. So, what we see is that when the substance is melting, the temperature doesn't change, and so what's happening at this point is that um, no more energy is being taken in because all of the energy that's added as it's becoming, you know, as it's reaching that melting point, um, the added energy is being used to overcome all of the attractive forces. And so you don't um, get an increase in temperature um, until you are all converted over to the liquid um, and then you can continue to increase the kinetic energy of the molecules in the liquid phase and then again as it's going through the vaporization right it's going to use the energy that it's taken in in order to break those intermolecular 
forces again until it's all converted over to a gas. And once it's converted over to a gas, then those particles can move around more and increase the kinetic energy. So what we're seeing here is that where you have your um, linear uh, portion of the graph here in the two different sections, it has to do with kinetic energy increasing and temperature increasing uh, simultaneously. And then on the next page, this is um, important. So this shows the relationship between vapor pressure and temperature. So what is the vapor pressure of a liquid? The vapor pressure of a liquid is a property that depends on, once again, the intermolecular forces. Um, it's, the express, it's the pressure exerted by vapor released from a liquid. So think about it. If the liquid releases its vapor easily, there's going to have, the liquid would have a high vapor pressure. And so if it releases its uh, vapors, if a liquid releases its vapors easily, then the intermolecular forces are weak. And if there's strong intermolecular forces, those particles are going to be held together more and they would result in a lower vapor pressure. So that's a really important relationship to understand right there. And so here I show a little bit of a, a graph illustration, graphical illustration of this. So boiling occurs when the vapor pressure is equal to the external pressure. Okay, so boiling occurs when the vapor pressure is equal to the external pressure. And so what we see, and then the external pressure is usually indicated by standard pressure, all right, or STP, you probably remember from gas laws, standard temperature and pressure um, are standard temperature zero degrees Celsius and standard pressure is uh, 760 mmHg or one atmosphere or 760 torr as I show right here. So if I were this, this is a classic vapor pressure graph. So what we can see here is that at standard atmospheric pressure, which is 760 millimeters of mercury, we can see that the liquids, the different liquids that are illustrated here, this would be water, this would be ethyl alcohol, and this is another organic substance called diethyl ether. And what we see is that we see the relationship between the atmospheric pressure and the temperature. And we can say that boiling occurs when the temperature of the pressure that the liquid exerts is equal to atmospheric pressure. So when you can have liquid heated up, sorry, when you can have water heated up enough to exert a vapor pressure equal to 760, it will be boiling. And so the same here is true for ethyl alcohol and here is true for diethyl ether. So what we see based on the shape of these curves is that the vapor pressure of the liquid changes with temperature. And so we can see here that since water has the highest temperature, what will, will, will has to reach the highest temperature of all of the three uh, liquids in order for boiling to occur. So what would we conclude from that what we, is that the, um, the vapor pressure that the water exists as, sorry, the vapor pressure that the water exerts as it's heating up is much lower than the other two liquids. And so it has to heat up high enough in order to exert the same pressure 
that ethyl alcohol would exert at a lower temperature that diethyl ether would exert at an even lower temperature. So based on this curve, we can conclude that water has the highest, sorry, the strongest intermolecular forces, ethyl alcohol would be next, and diethyl ether would have the least uh, strength of intermolecular forces because it's going to reach that vapor pressure of 760 mmHg at a much lower temperature and therefore boil much easier. Okay, I'll go on. I hope I um, helped you understand that. So now this brings us to our last uh, piece, which are phase diagrams. Phase diagrams are classic uh, representation um, in chemistry that everyone should have an understanding of. And so the, the shape of a phase diagram is always the same. You're always going to have these um, same uh, sections that look very similar. Um, really what differs is the tilt of the line here, the solid liquid line. And so you're always going to have solid liquid gas. Those are going to be the three sections. And it's always going to be your um, pressure on the y-axis. And you're going to have um, temperature on the x-axis. So it's the relationship between pressure and temperature and the phases that will exist at each of those conditions. And so what we can see is that um, depending upon what you do, whether you're increasing temperature, so you could move a solid at any one particular pressure, let's say at one atmosphere of pressure, I could move my solid into the gaseous phase as long as I can keep the pressure the same but what would I have to do to provide that change? If I look all the way across here, I would go through and eventually, if I keep increasing, I would, increasing my temperature, I would move from the solid phase into the gaseous phase. So, uh, that, just scroll down here a little bit. So, this is a significant difference here between these two. Um, most substances, your um, solid liquid line will slant off to the right. As you can see in this one up here, the solid liquid line slit, shifts to the left. And so what this slant of this line tells me is that the solid phase is more dense than the liquid phase. And so this, and that's what, that's typical of solid versus liquid. This one happens to be a representation of water because the solid phase is less dense than the liquid phase and it's solid liquid line shifts over to the left. So that is, and we all, if you think about it, you put ice in water, what happens? Ice floats, ice is less dense than water. My phase diagram illustrates that by that slant. And then typically a solid is going to be uh, more dense than the liquid. And so the vast majority of your phase diagrams slant in that direction. Okay, I'm going to scroll down a little bit here. All right, and then I think I'm going to go to my last slide. Or am I on it? Oh, I'm on my last slide. Okay. So, oh no, sorry, I'm back here. This one's a kind of a busy one, but this has some important aspects to it. So this one, and I'll, I'll just leave you guys to kind of review this yourselves and you can see the problems that I have and the problems that associated with it. But there are some important points here. Um, one here is, this is called the triple point, and that's just the point where all three phases are in equilibrium with each other. And then this here is called the critical point, point D. Nope, sorry, it's point B. 
um, and the critical temperature is the temperature above which no liquid can form. Um, and then there's just a few little details over here that are really just um, interesting aspects of the phase diagram. So hope that's helpful and um, we'll be back for chapter 13.